unemployed dropout, get out. In the midst of a blizzard, my brother and his wife chased me out, barefoot, into the garden. I will never forget this humiliation. Though I possess neither education, health, nor wealth, the one thing I do have is inner strength. One day, I will make them regret this incident. My name is Courtney. I am a 48-year-old who loves nothing more than to soak in the bath after a long day at work. Especially in this slightly chilly season, a bath feels absolutely divine. Such leisure and enjoyment were things the old me could never afford. In my mid-twenties, my brother Nathan started his own business, focusing on environmental issues by creating accessories and interior goods from recycled plastics, driftwood, and sea glass. With hardly any competition, his business was a roaring success, just as he had planned. However, as his company grew, his character seemed to diminish in proportion. Despite having money, he became increasingly reluctant to spend it, finding pleasure in watching his earnings accumulate. Nathan transitioned from being frugal to outright miserly. I lived at home with our mother while Nathan lived alone nearby. But as he became more and more of a cheapskate, he made a habit of returning to our parents' house every Friday night, staying until Sunday morning to save on food and utilities, shamelessly exploiting the short distance to save two days' worth of living expenses, yet contributing nothing to our household. But we had no way to kick him out as our mother, who had raised us single-handedly, was now bedridden with early-onset dementia. With my mother requiring constant care, barely responsive, I had no time to deal with Nathan. He took advantage of the situation and stole money from my wallet to satisfy his cravings, mocking my protests with taunts about my inability to survive without him. He felt entitled to look down on me because I suffer from a chronic illness, a type of autoimmune disease, that with medication and a balanced lifestyle allows for a normal life. However, any imbalance could land me in the hospital. If I were to be hospitalized or collapsed, I would have no choice but to rely on my brother. Since falling ill in middle school and constantly being in and out of the hospital, I ended up with only a middle school education. I did get employed, however my salary is quite modest. My adult life has been relatively stable health-wise, allowing me to keep working, but I could fall ill at any time. Thus, I skimp on food and utilities to save for the future, scraping by while Nathan squanders the money I painstakingly save. With no one else to rely on, I had no choice but to endure his dominance. Despite having no money, education, or a healthy body, I had to comply with my brother's demands. A while had passed and Nathan announced he had gotten married. How typical of him to inform us way after. Just thinking about what kind of person that brother would choose made me feel uneasy. I hoped she would be kind, but when he brought her over on his usual Friday, she appeared prim but was essentially a more intensified version of my brother. My sister-in-law, Janet, worked as Nathan's secretary. As a married couple where both are earning well, one would expect them to be financially independent. Yet, not only did they make their usual weekend visits, they also began coming over three times during the week, even when I was not home, using their keys to let themselves in. Previously, they would just eat and leave, but now Janet started bringing their laundry over to save on their water bill, gleefully noting the savings. To top it off, they even had me wash their laundry. When it dried, they would come over again to swap out the clean laundry for their accumulated dirty clothes. It escalated to them taking home toothbrushes I had bought in advance, and sometimes even bringing over a cooler to steal food from the fridge while I was away. It was beyond being miserly. It was theft. I had told the caregiver looking after my mother not to let my brother and his wife in when they visited, but it was considered a family matter, beyond the scope of their services, and they advised resolving it within the family, fearing what might happen if they refused. The home care service I was using was the cheapest in the area and being disliked by this company would undoubtedly cause problems. Should I change the locks? But then again, I might not be able to rely on my brother in times of trouble. The fear of such a situation arising was too great for me. However, if things continued the way they were, my savings would only decrease. After much deliberation, I told my brother, if you're going to come over, at least help with taking care of our mother. It would save on caregiver expenses. But my brother ignored this. Furthermore, he declared, we've given up our apartment as of today and plan to live here from now on. And true to their word, with barely any belongings, my brother and his wife moved into our house without my consent. After their move, stress caused me to suffer from insomnia and my chronic illness began to worsen. I started getting fevers due to fatigue but didn't want to take time off work. I wanted to save my paid leave for emergencies with my mother. However, my brother and his wife, unconcerned for my well-being, 
would send me out to the store even with a fever and pushed all the household chores onto me without the slightest contribution to living expenses. Is there any way I could kick out my own brother without causing a commotion? I wondered, naively worrying about such an impossible task. Not long after, my mother passed away. She had developed a complication from a cold and had to be hospitalized. I wasn't able to take care of her at home. I don't remember much after that. The flurry of events and my own poor health had me feverish throughout the morning period. It might have been due to exhaustion but eventually my chronic illness worsened, which required me to take a significant amount of steroids for treatment. Though I was able to avoid hospitalization, the medication weakened my immune system, and I was advised to recuperate at home and avoid going out. When I informed my company, they said, we understand you're going through a tough time, however we would like you to re-sign. Reason was due to many missed work days when I had to take care of my mother. Regrettable, but I had no choice. Thus, I began my recovery at home. However, what? Why did you quit your job? You should have just taken a leave of absence. My brother exclaimed angrily. Janet, with a serious expression on her face, added, If you aren't working, who's going to pay for the household expenses? I couldn't take time off. I plan to recover at home for a while. If you two plan to live here, you should contribute to the living expenses. It's not fair for me to keep paying for everything. Upon hearing my words, my brother and his wife exchanged displeased looks. No way. What? My brother, with a serious face, said he didn't want to bear the living expenses, leaving me shocked. We moved in because it saved us money and allowed us to save up. If it doesn't save us money, then it's just a property with an annoying sister attached, right, Janet? That's right. But we don't want to rent an apartment and pay rent again at this point. Ah, uh, but this house, since it's quite old, it's much cheaper than renting an apartment. Oh, is that so? How would it be if we started paying the living expenses? Compared to now, practically being free of charge, the burden would indeed increase, but it would still be much cheaper than before. I see. How long will you be unable to work? Needless to say, I was appalled by my brother and his wife's gold calculation of financial matters and Janet's question. An ominous feeling washed over me. For now, I don't know how long it's going to take me to recover. I'll see once I get better. Janet pondered my answer for a while with a hum of contemplation. Hey, Nathan, what if we just take this house for ourselves? Hum, if Courtney can't work, we'd have to support her. It would be a loss for us if we had to pay for living expenses and such. Exactly. Courtney is just in the way. You're right. We should just kick out the unemployed dropout. Nathan said, grabbing my clothes and smiling. You can't be serious. Of course I am. It's cheaper if it's just the two of us rather than three. You're in the way. You're the ones who barged into this house. Why should I be the one to leave? You're way too loud. I'll apologize so just be quiet. Go on, get out. Sorry, Courtney. Despite their apologies, my brother and his wife showed no remorse as they forcibly pushed me from the living room through the large window out to the garden. Goodbye. With a big smirk on their face, they threw my bag packed with belongings while ignoring my pleas to let me back in. They locked the window and drew the curtains, making sure I couldn't see inside. No matter how much I knocked, I was ignored and left outside in the heavy snow, barefoot and without a destination or money in my wallet. It was infuriating to be thrown out despite having paid for living expenses and taking care of our deceased mother. However, I had no desire to live under the same roof as my brother and Janet, who spoke to me in such a manner. When I was kicked out, I had nothing but the clothes I was wearing, so I spent some time resting inside a train station. It was the only place with a roof and lights on at night. During the day, I looked at free job magazines and finally found a live and part-time job. Considering my weak body, I technically shouldn't be allowed to work, however I couldn't afford to say no. I decided to work on a farm, hiding my illness, even though it was a physically demanding job. I had no time to be picky and ended up taking the first live-in job I could find. This became a turning point in my life. The family running the farm was very kind. They soon noticed my illness, and it turned out their daughter had the same condition. They allowed me to work without pushing myself too hard. Though I thought physical labor wasn't for me, the work was mostly in the morning, allowing me to have a clear distinction between work and rest. I found that if I rested well in the afternoon and went to bed earlier than others, it didn't interfere with my work at all. Thinking back, I had been juggling between caring for my mother, working and dealing with my brother and his wife. Life here was like paradise compared to that. After getting involved in agriculture, I realized I had been wasting a lot of vegetable scraps that could be used for dishes like pickled vegetables or tea. There's hardly anything that's truly considered waste. 
That's when it hit me. What if we use the discarded parts to make and sell processed goods? I shared my idea with the farm owners, and since such services were rare at the time, they suggested, if you can make something from the crops we don't need, would you mind using them? Turning what farmers deemed unnecessary into sellable products was akin to reducing food loss, a concept that's well regarded today. Many found the idea intriguing and soon, with the help of the farm owners, I began learning about business management and started my own company. Three years after being kicked out by my brother, I turned 30. Seven years later, my company had grown significantly, with annual sales exceeding $20 million. Focusing on food loss and other environmental issues seemed to have been a good choice, as my efforts started getting media attention. A decade had passed since I separated from my brother. The only thing that bothered me was that we ended up doing similar work, but seeing my company grow felt like being recognized by society. Owning a company allowed me to employ capable staff and work without overexerting myself. On yet another ordinary day, my company got featured on a local news program, and I visited the studio. After the recording, as I was getting up, I was greeted by my brother Nathan, whom I hadn't seen in a long time. I'm here because my company will be featured on this program next week. I was next door for an interview. I heard you were coming, so I decided to show my face. You should be grateful, he said with a smug look. Janet, my sister-in-law, was there too. The staff seemed to know about our relationship and suggested, it's surprising to hear your siblings. Having you both on next week's show could be interesting. I didn't expect him to be here and it made me uncomfortable, but it was a good opportunity. Pardon me, but who are you? What? I asked without a smile and tilting my head seriously. Nathan looked surprised and the staff were speechless. Have we met somewhere before? Come on, Courtney, stop joking. What are you saying? I lost my memory about 10 years ago due to stress. According to the staff, you're my brother, right? I don't remember anything. Can I confirm a few things? Uh, yeah. You didn't know I had amnesia, even though we're real siblings. Were we not on good terms? We were very close. We even lived together. Nathan hesitantly answered, choosing to lie given the presence of others. How come we are living separately now? It's because I got married. I actually kept a diary. It starts with being kicked out of the house barefoot in heavy snow. What? You're also surprised it seems? If you know anything, could you please tell me? If we were so close, why was I kicked out in the middle of winter? Was it some kind of incident? No, it's just… Apparently, a couple named Nathan and Janet suddenly moved in with me while I was caring for our mother and eventually kicked me out. I asked without showing much expression, pretending to be genuinely inquiring about their names, causing a stir among the staff. The company president and his wife's name are Nathan and Janet, right? Clearly, both my brother and Janet realized they were being talked about and turned pale. After that couple moved in, I seemed to have become stressed and fell ill. I was forced to quit my job and even got kicked out of the house because they said it would increase their burden if I stayed. Quite scary if what's in the diary is true. Plus, I apparently supported them and got no help with living expenses in return, doing all the household chores alone. I wonder who these people are? I don't think I am the type to live with strangers, but I don't remember anything. Maybe you know something? By this point, the staff were looking at my brother and his wife with cold eyes. Some started to think, maybe she got amnesia from the shock of being kicked out. It was hard to deny in that situation. Oh well. My brother and Janet stood there, not knowing what to do, looking as if they wanted to say something. As I was enjoying their dilemma, the director's voice rang out, what's going on? Turning around, I saw the cameraman apologizing repeatedly. The staff quickly approached and informed us. It seems the camera wasn't switched off, and the conversation was broadcasted. Unexpectedly, this turned out to be a fortunate event for me. Nathan was furious, yelling, what are you doing? And Janet shouted, do something. Seeing their reaction, the staff started saying, so you did kick out your sister. Wow, that's cruel, and so on. Realizing there was no way out, Nathan, in frustration, exclaimed, Ah, it's all your fault. Huh? What did I do? I asked. You remember everything, don't you? Nathan accused. What do you mean? I would appreciate it if you could tell me. The moment I said that, my brother Nathan froze on the spot. He realized that explaining what he remembered would require him to confess his own wrongdoings. Janet seemed to realize the same thing and rushed over to Nathan, urging him to stop, saying, Let's stop this. It could affect the company's reputation. Encouraged by Janet, Nathan muttered, you'll remember this, and left the scene. Later on, the events of that day were published in a weekly magazine article. 
Of course, I was approached for an interview, but I stuck to the story that I don't remember anything. If I said anything, they would just deny it. However, an evasive answer from the perpetrator is just like a politician's I do not recall. You say you don't remember, but doesn't your brother remember? They pressed, and as Nathan continued to give vague responses, his misdeeds were written up as if they were facts. Of course, since it wasn't proven to be the truth, they couldn't explicitly write it out. But to anyone reading, it seemed like, if he's not answering clearly, he probably did it. As a result, Nathan acquired a negative image in the public eye as an evasive manager and prone to cover-ups, which inevitably affected the company's image. Consequently, the company's performance began to decline rapidly. The fame of being a young, handsome CEO vanished into thin air. On my end, I was seen as someone who must have gone through a lot of hardship to achieve success, which naturally led to good business performance. About two years later, Nathan resigned as the company's representative. Just having Nathan as the representative was creating a negative image for the company. So he was ousted by the vice president. I heard that a faction of vice presidents within the company wanting to remove Nathan even staged a coup d'etat. The company, struggling with continuous losses, couldn't pay employee salaries and had to reluctantly dip into the savings Nathan had been so reluctant to use. Nathan and Janet, now jobless, came to me begging to be allowed to work at my company. Let's forget about the past. Can't you hire us? I declined, saying, I can't remember you and or the past you're asking to forget. Besides, we're currently cutting staff costs so. The fact that the next day 15 new employees joined my company was a secret. Since then, I've ignored all contact from Nathan. There was a time I couldn't have imagined doing such a thing for fear of being abandoned by my brother. But now, I'm okay. I have trustworthy colleagues and have gotten married. After undergoing fertility treatments, I was also blessed with a child and am leading a fulfilling life. I will never be afraid of my brother again. If you live diligently, God will take good care of you and you will be rewarded. Just as my mother taught me when I was a child, the encounters I've had with many people helped me when I was at my lowest, and who led me through it all might have been God himself. Who knows? I will continue to live diligently, holding my mother's teachings close to my heart. I hope to be a mother my children can be proud of, just like my own mother was to me. You're an adult. Don't rely on your parents anymore, you parasite. You're only staying in this house because you don't have to pay rent, aren't you? Such a spoiled excuse won't be tolerated. Get out right now. Michael's words were cold and sharp. They call me jobless because I work from home. Even though I didn't want it, they placed my mother in a nursing home. I couldn't take it anymore. Karen giggled, looking at me oddly. I truly couldn't understand what was so funny. My name is Rachel. Until now, I had spent relaxed days at my parents' home. Happy family days, always centered around the warmth of my parents. However, one day, an accident changed my mother's life. Now, she needs a wheelchair to go outside and can't move around the house without a walker. Still, I was always moved by her acceptance of this change. Alongside her, my father, Richard, has always been the strong pillar supporting our family. Yet, he's now in his 70s. His age never showed when he supported my mother and he always appeared so reliable. That's why I've stayed home all this time, helping them. But all that changed with one unexpected event. Suddenly, my father collapsed and passed away. It was a heart attack. From that day, our home became even quieter. Amidst that silence, I was lost, not knowing what to do. The sudden news of my father's death was unbelievable for our family. Linda, my mother, was especially engulfed in deep sorrow and cried until the funeral. Seeing her like that broke my heart. Though I'm the eldest daughter, traditionally, the role of the chief mourner should be taken by the eldest son, Stephen. But he said, let Rachel handle that tedious task and dodge the responsibility nonchalantly. On the day of the funeral, I didn't get a chance to cry until the moment my father was cremated. I was too busy with my duties. I couldn't stop my tears from flowing when reality hit me at the crematorium. Seeing me, Lisa, Stephen's wife, remarked coldly, Aren't you embarrassed, crying so much as an adult? Michael joined in, saying, It's pitiful. I wish you'd calm down a bit. Despite being taken aback by their words, I took my mother's wheelchair and spent some quiet moments with her away from the crowd. 
We held each other's hands and shared memories of my father, his gentle smile and the days we spent together. As we reminisced, Linda and I decided determinedly, from now on, it's just the two of us. Let's join our strengths and look forward. After the funeral, Michael and Lisa left without saying a word to us. I never imagined they'd leave so early considering it was our father's funeral. With dad's sudden passing, something changed within our family. Steven's attitude especially felt somewhat distant, but mom comforted me, saying, everyone has their way of grieving. Steven is probably shedding tears inside, so I suppressed my feelings. After that, a quiet life began for mom and I. I worked as a freelance programmer at home. My parents never truly grasped what I did for a living. However, since I consistently contributed to the household finances, they probably believed I was working genuinely. As I continued to do my programming work at home, taking care of household chores and caring for my mother became challenging. When my father was around, he handled most of the household work. But now, I'm responsible for all household tasks and taking care of my mother. Still, I couldn't compromise on my job as a programmer. A significant issue was the debt my father had taken on as a co-signer for a friend. That friend of his ran away, leaving our family to shoulder the debt. My father, even after retirement, took on part-time jobs, trying his best to repay it. But with him gone, that responsibility fell on me. It was tough every day, but mom and I were prepared to face any challenges together. I worked hard to repay the debts as the debt collectors came every month. It was nerve-wracking when the repayment date approached. Handling house chores, working, caregiving, and shouldering all these responsibilities were harder than I thought. But I didn't want to worry my mother. So, no matter how exhausted I was, I always tried to be cheerful around her. However, every time Michael visited, it felt like all my efforts went down the drain. His house is about an hour's drive from our family home. While I appreciate him occasionally checking on mom, he always criticized my work. Are you still obsessed with that keyboard job? He always mocked the work I was seriously committed to. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm earning decently as a freelancer. Whether you like it or not, I'm choosing and walking my own path. Freelancing, to be honest, just sounds like you're showing off, doesn't it? He sarcastically remarked as usual. Michael has always been the perfect son, admired by everyone ever since we were kids. I've always been compared to him, often recognized merely as Michael's sister. Just like always, his visit started with some nitpicking towards me, but today, he seemed to have something serious to discuss with mom. After a brief exchange, he swiftly moved to her room. I was a bit curious and discreetly observed what was happening inside. Michael, looking a bit disgruntled, was voicing his concerns about my work. Isn't it because you've spoiled Rachel that she hasn't taken on a proper job? His voice was filled with clear dissatisfaction. Our mother, with a look of acceptance, took a deep breath and responded, I may not know in detail what Rachel is doing, but I believe she's chosen her path and is doing her best. If she's happy with it, that's what matters to me. Michael frowned at her words. But isn't it your fault that Rachel's always cooped up at home? For Rachel's sake, maybe it's best if you move to a senior home. At that moment, I felt a strong urge to defend my mother and share my determination. I chose to be a freelancer, captivated by the flexible hours and the allure of programming. The time I could spend with my mother and being able to support her were part of that decision. But they weren't the only reasons. I impulsively opened the door and, as I walked toward my mother, I said, It's not because of you that I chose this path, Mom. I chose this job because it's the right one for me. Linda smiled with gratitude. I know you didn't choose this just for me, Rachel. With Michael's surprised face in my peripheral view, I continued, I never see you as a burden, Mom. My mother gently held my hand in response to my words. At that moment, I felt our bond has deepened more than ever before. Rachel, thank you. I'm so grateful for all the care you've given me with all your heart, but I want you to have more time for yourself. Tears welled up in my eyes at her words. Rachel, you're an adult. 
You should be shining in a bigger world. There's no need to be tied down to this house. His voice was as stern as always, but there was a hint of concern. After he escorted me out of the room, Michael began discussing moving our mother into a senior home. Before I knew it, it was decided that she would live in a new place. The house felt so quiet and lonely compared to the times when our family was together. Sometimes when I visited mom at the senior home, I felt relieved seeing her chatting happily with new friends. However, somewhere deep down, I felt angry that Michael had made the decision on his own. One day, I received an unexpected call from Michael. Keep Sunday free, he said without checking my availability, and hung up. I was fed up with his domineering attitude. Come Sunday morning, Michael and his wife Karen arrived. The moment they entered my room, a surprising proposal came up. Don't you think this house is a bit too big for you, Rachel? Karen added with a smile. Actually, we were thinking of moving into this house. Rachel, can you find another place to stay? I was taken aback, and all I could mutter was, what? Michael blurted out, you've been relying on our parents even as an adult, haven't you? You never leave this house because you don't have to pay rent. There's no way such a lame excuse can be acceptable. Just leave now. Karen stood next to him with a smirk on her face. A whirlwind of emotions rose within me, but I managed to respond. Fine, I'll leave. But from now on, stay out of my business. In response, Michael suggested, let's sever our sibling ties then. It will give both of us a new start, right? I nodded in agreement, saying, that's fine with me. Soon after, I began searching for a new place and quickly found an apartment I liked. Moving was relatively quick since I didn't have much stuff. The new apartment was just right for living alone. It was bright with good ventilation and very comfortable. The pressure I felt in the large house back home gradually faded in this new environment. To my surprise, I quickly began to enjoy this new phase of my life. Even shopping at the nearby small supermarket was fun. This fresh start brought me new discoveries and hope. On a sunny day, a month later, I got an unexpected call from Michael, who had claimed we had severed ties. There was a hint of urgency in his voice. Rachel, is it true that dad had accumulated debts? I realized that I hadn't told Michael about it. For me, the debt issue had become like an everyday thing and I didn't think it was anything special. Why didn't you tell me sooner? The entire neighborhood is buzzing with rumors. Karen's too scared to even step outside. How did you manage to keep those intimidating debt collectors quiet? I responded calmly. It's quite simple. I was paying back the debt every month. Really? But the collectors say it's $1,000 a month. How did you manage to pay that? Well, it was a bit tight, but my freelance work was going well, so I managed. I had been working hard and supporting both the debt repayment and our household. Michael, on the other hand, had a stable job in a big company but hadn't seen much career growth or salary increase. I had been guessing that my income might be more than his, and it seemed I was right. Michael sounded desperate. Honestly, $1,000 is a bit too much for me. Can you help me out? I replied coldly, reminding him of our previous conversation. We've severed our sibling ties, remember? Discuss with Karen and manage your finances. Without waiting for a response, I hung up. The calls from Michael didn't stop. I had a feeling something major had happened. The next morning, the doorbell rang. Looking through the peephole, I saw Michael and Karen, both looking quite remorseful, holding a gift probably as a token of apology. They had learned my new address from mom and came over. Without opening the door, I spoke through the intercom. Why have you come here? I asked. Tears were evident in Michael's eyes as he said, I'm really, really sorry. I have no one else to turn to. Please help me. Karen was also bowing her head in the background. It seemed Michael had made some bad investments and lost a significant amount of money. Their plan was to take over the family home, cut down living expenses, and repay the debt with the inheritance from our father. The whole idea of moving mom to a nursing home and driving me out of the house was all Michael's plot. But all they found from our father's inheritance was a massive debt. 
I thought we'd claim the house and pay back the debts with dad's inheritance. I had no idea all he left behind was this much debt, he said, his voice choked with emotion. However, we had decided to cut ties as siblings. Don't you remember? We decided we're not siblings anymore. If you keep bothering me, I'll have to talk to the police, I said coldly, dismissing them both. I could tell from their expressions they were devastated, but what happened to them was none of my business. A while later, during a walk near my old home, I discovered that it was up for sale. Surprised, I spoke to a neighbor who told me about the constant confrontations between Michael, Karen, and the debt collectors. They seemed to have disappeared suddenly, possibly due to their financial troubles. I just hoped they were happy, wherever they were. My life, on the other hand, was fulfilling. The work was busy. There were plenty of delightful events to keep me going, especially the times I went out with friends from the tennis club or the wonderful dates with a special someone I met there. I shared the news with mom, saying, Mom, I've met someone. She smiled happily and said, As long as you're happy, I am too. Her words filled my heart to a brim. I'm looking forward to the future, walking side by side with the person I've chosen to share my life with. My future looks bright.